<laughs> okay, uh, so any questions on Tuesday's material? Yes, sir. Um, so when we prescribe opiates with the pruritus, can we also give them Benadryl? You so could. So what, what's a good example of a, a opioid that would do that? Uh, or no, morphine. Yeah, morphine is one of the big ones, and, and by virtue, what else uh, could do that as well? Because it gets turned into morphine. Codeine. Codeine would be another big one that has a lot of pruritus uh, associated with it. Yes, so you could uh, prescribe something like a Benadryl, like an H1 blocker, to, to deal with that. What are some potential pitfalls? Are they even Sleepiness. Well, they are. Hmm? Yeah, how are they going to be awake? Yeah, how are they going to be awake for it, right? So you worry about kind of the concomitant uh, CNS depression you would see with the antihistamine plus that. So, um, you're right. So again, that's one of those things and a big warning you're going to give a lot of your patients is like, hey, don't operate heavy machinery while you are on these medications, right? And so, especially <coughs> if they're opioid naive, they're just starting out on it, you worry about significant CNS depression. So I probably would not want to um, have that combination. Now, if on the inpatient side, I don't really care, right? Like I can give them both and they're, they're not going anywhere. What about like right? an H2 blocker, Claritin or something? Um, well, an H2 blocker would be something like um, ranitidine or Zantac. We'll talk about that in the GI section, but um, you really would, that really is only gonna work for the GI tract, right? So some people do get some nausea, vomiting, some GI upset with some of these opioids, but um, that's not a common drug we would do as a prophylactic, right? So really H1 blockers would be the thing that would block the histamine issues, like the pruritus and things you would see with morphine. Um, but that's not something we would always give as a, as a prophylactic. Clinically, are you gonna just switch the drugs? I'd probably end up switching drugs. So if I know they have like significant pruritus associated with morphine, I'd probably just give them like oxycodone or um, hydromorphone or anything like that. Okay, and also, mm -hmm. do we see the same kind of tolerance build up with barbiturates as, or benzos rather as we would with um, yeah, absolutely. So a good point I was going to make, and, and so we mentioned that like, you know, you see significant CNS depression. We'll talk about adverse effects of opioids as a class in just a minute. Um, but you see tolerance to a lot of those sedative effects, right? So for instance, when I was in fellowship, we, I was helping out my, um, the, the director for the poison center. He would sometimes get called in as an expert witness for certain court cases, right? And so one of the questions we had on, on a case um, was that basically a guy was filling um, a huge amount of opioids at this um, at this pharmacy, he had, he had a lot of chronic pain issues, so he was also getting like, you know, some, some uh, antispasmodic medications, you know, some uh, muscle spasm meds that can also cause sedation and some benzos and things like that. So the guy had a lot, quite a, quite a cocktail of medications, and so then he um, got into his car, drove off, ended up getting to a wreck, and, and I don't remember if anyone died or not, but there was some injury that had occurred. So the question was, was this gentleman impaired? Right, and so you could do blood levels on the guy, and certainly see the medications were in his system. But the question is, was he impaired? Mm. That's a very difficult question, right? Because a lot of these chronic pain guys, or anyone who's on these medications long term, they develop tolerance to a lot of those sedative effects. <coughs> so just like you see with you know functional alcoholics who can have a level of say you know uh, a legally drunk level is eighty <coughs> or 0.08, you know you can have patients who have a level of two hundred and are just like I am right now, right? I'm only at probably a level of a, you know, 0.1 or 100 um, most mornings, but you know, so so there there's a large degree of tolerance, and so you can have people who are have very high levels of, of some of these medications. It can be totally functional, right? Versus someone who is naive to those effects, they would be you know under the table essentially. Um, so yeah, so they do develop a lot of tolerance to those effects. You can see the same thing with benzodiaz uh, benzodiazepines. You can see the same thing with uh, barbiturates. We'll talk about those drugs when we get to neurology and behavioral. Um, but yeah, so you can definitely see tolerance. And also withdrawal effects when you start to remove those medications as well. Any other questions I can answer? Yeah, so one of the things I was going to mention with um, you know, the, the paritis you see with the, the morphine, a lot of people, you get kind of scared when you switch over from something like a morphine over to like uh, a hydromorphone or Dilaudid because some people see that as like a really big gun. Um, but really, if you're looking at equipotent dosages between the drugs, you're not really having any excess effect, right? So it's really important to make sure you're using kind of apples to apples in terms of dosing, and we'll talk about conversions in just a little bit. Um, but you can use a, 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 an equivalent dose of hydromorphone to the, that of morphine, and they're not gonna get any more sleepy, they're not gonna get any more um, <coughs> respiratory depressant you would see with those, those similar doses. So be aware of that, that every dose uh, of an opioid has a, uh, an equivalent, it's just a matter of how that conversion gets done. Any other questions? Any of your behavioral tests? I might get, I touched on some behavioral stuff towards the end of this, depending on how quickly I get through it. Um, so we'll talk about some of it there, but any questions I can answer for that? You guys are well-versed, just ready to go. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, uh, so general guidelines for when you're selecting your opioid. So again, you're going to be picking your agent based on, on pain intensity, based on other pharmacologic factors, like what other kind of medications do they have on board that could be interacting. Um, you look at things like coexisting conditions and also economic factors. So it might sound really good to put them on a brand new extended release opioid, but if it's really expensive compared to you know something like extended release morphine, which is really cheap, um, then that might not be a good option for them. So consider the economic factors, what their insurance might be covering. And typically when you have chronic pain patients, you want them to ha be on a long-term controller medication. So that would be something like an extended release oxycodone or morphine. And then for breakthrough pain, that's when you're gonna have your short acting as needed medications. So for instance, for someone who's on say oxycodone, they would be on oxycontin, which is the extended release version, say every 12 to eight hours. Uh, and then you would have uh, that on board for their kind of just uh, baseline level pain and then you would end up having immediate release oxycodone on top of that for any breakthrough issues. So say you get, uh, the person has to get up and walk around, that exacerbates their pain, that's when they would use that other medication as needed, right? So you'd have a scheduled long-acting medication. So that would just be, you know, for instance, you know, oxycodone extended release 20 milligrams every eight hours. No PRN on that, right? Because that's what you're gonna use around the clock. And then you have a PRN for breakthrough pain medication on top of that, that's immediate release, okay? So if I were to ask you a question, I would say, you know, this patient is on this regimen, which part of this would, uh, which part of this regimen does not make sense? And if I had like an extended release drug as needed, that doesn't really make sense. Or if I had a short acting med um, scheduled uh, without a PRN, you know, uh, indicator on there, that would be an inappropriate <coughs> as well, right? So just keep that in mind. Those are the kind of questions I might ask. So um, in general, as far as route of administration goes, oral is going to be preferred whenever possible. But if you imagine the, the time to onset, what's going to have a faster onset of action? Oral or say something like IV. IV, of course, right. So if they're having an acute, very severe pain issue, IV is going to be the way to go for the most part. Um, transdermal products are not good for acute pain, right? So these are going to be medications that take time in order to diffuse across the skin. So they're better for long-term chronic pain management. Okay, so for instance, if I were to say a patient comes in with a broken arm, uh, you want to treat their pain, which one of these drugs would be inappropriate? The transdermal fentanyl patch would not be appropriate for acute pain issues because that takes time, up to a day or so, before the drug is really diffused across the skin and actually start to have its effects. And so I had a good question about this um, previously. Um, they were saying, well, you know, if you're converting, say, someone from, say, they're on a uh, hydromorphone or dilated continuous drip, and then you want to switch them over to transdermal fentanyl in order to send them home, you know, how would you start those up? How would you convert that patient over? You don't want to stop the continuous infusion <laughs> and then put them on the patch immediately afterwards because then they're going to have withdrawal pain issues, right? You need to do a thing where you would actually start them up or have them on the continuous drip. You put the patch on, and then, say, 12 hours later, you start to cut down the hydromorphone as that drug starts to diffuse in through the skin. And then, say, at 24 hours, you take the hydromorphone off and then they're just on the fentanyl patch at that point right so remember there's kind of has to be a, a continuous amount of drug being administered but it takes time for that patch to diffuse across and then um, if you need uh, acute pain management but say the IV access is not available so say like you have a young child who IVs are very difficult to get um, or if you have someone who just has not had a chance to have an IV placed yet uh, intranasal fentanyl is another very good option for acute pain um, Dosing actually gets to be a little bit different. So if, say for instance, an IV dose of fentanyl, say something like one microgram per kilogram, you have to give a little bit more than that uh, via the intranasal route because you don't get complete bioavailability. And so uh, you may get something like you know, 1.5 or two micrograms per kilogram. So you don't have to remember the dose, just remember you may need to give a little bit more in order to overcome um, the fact that you don't have 100% bioavailability when giving something that transmucosal uh, route. Um, uh, dosing also should be individualized. In general, you want to start low and go slow, especially for your more chronic pain uh, patients. And uh, just remember, you can always give more, but you can't take it back, right? So once they put that injection in, uh, that medication is there. I don't necessarily want to have to jump to my reversal agents unless I really have to. Um, so start low, go slow. So um, conversions, I kind of alluded to these last time. And so conversions are often necessary if you need to move a patient from one type of drug to another. Um, it could be whole drug switches that you're doing. It could be uh, formulation switches. Say you're going from an oral dosage form to an IV dosage form. Say they're coming inpatient. It could be the, uh, the opposite. Say you're trying to send them home. Um, if they are uh, having issues, say they, the formulary medication that you have at your hospital is not the same as what they're on at home, you may want to convert them as well. So lots of reasons why you may switch per, uh, persons from one drug to another another and so this requires very careful calculations and so every hospital uh, will mostly likely have a conversion chart or there's lots of them that are available online um, they're all pretty good but they may have some slight variations between them but essentially what they're trying to do is say that if you have um, 
you know, say a person is on transdermal fentanyl, so they're getting 50 micrograms per hour, what would be the equivalent amount of oral morphine that would equal that amount of fentanyl that you're getting, right? Or And then once you kind of convert everything back to oral morphine, because that's kind of your baseline standard, then you can start to convert it to, say, IV hydromorphone, or you can convert it over into oral oxycodone, or whatever it happens to be. Um, but these conversions have to happen to make sure that you don't own, underdose or overdose your patient. And so um, make sure you ask for help the first couple times you're doing these, so especially if you have a handy pharmacist around that can help you out with some of that. Um, that can be very useful. And then uh, there's also this idea of incomplete cross tolerance, where essentially um, by switching a patient over to a new medication, they may not really have the same type of tolerance they had to, to the, what they're normally on. And so because of that, once you get your conversion down, um, you can actually drop your dose by around 25 to 50% to account for that. And then if their pain is not under control, then you can kind of steadily go back up on that dose. Because remember, you can always give more, but you can't take it back necessarily. And so the other big thing to remember when you're doing this, and I'll show you an example of how we do this, is to include all sources of opioids. So for instance, if you have a patient who's coming in uh, inpatient and they are on, say, uh, long-acting medication throughout the day, and they're on PRN uh, medication for breakthrough pain, um, you want to convert them over to a continuous infusion of drug. Um, in order to do that, you need to take into account what they're on, on their baseline, so that 24-hour kind of coverage, uh, long-acting medication, and then you want to kind of get an average of what they're doing for breakthrough pain. So for instance, if they're on, um, say, oxycodone, you know, twice a day, uh, the extended release formulation, uh, and they say maybe take uh, immediate release oxycodone, say three, three times a day on average, um, then you want to take in those three doses into your total calculations. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. So um, this very scary chart is not anything you need to memorize. This is really just for uh, illustrative purposes. But essentially, what you can look at is um, you're looking at your patients. Let me get my laser pointer out. Essentially, what you can do is say, like, okay, I have a patient who is on oral oxycodone. I can look at their total oral dose for the 24-hour period. And then basically, you can convert that back over to morphine oral equivalents, right? And then once you're back at this oral morphine equivalence, then you can change it over to whatever you want. So at that point, you can look to see what, you know, say the IV dose of hydromorphone would be equivalent to, right? Because we said that, you know, something like um, IV hydromorphone is something like 15 times more potent than oral morphine, right? And so you have to take these conversions into account, and that's where a lot of these uh, numbers are coming from, is the equivalent uh, potencies uh, between the different patients, or between the different dosage forms. And so where do you think a lot of this information came from? Yeah, a lot of it's trial and error, unfortunately. That's why you see some differences in the numbers there. Because again, not everyone responds to these medications the same. So someone's conversion from oxycodone over to morphine may be a little bit different than their neighbor, right? Because of the fact they have, you know, differences in their in their mu receptors and they have little uh, variations in how they metabolize these drugs. So these are kind of population averages. Not everyone's going to be um, reacting the same way to this, which is why you worry about that incomplete cross tolerance and you drop your dose down, say, by 25 to 50 percent, right? So a uh, good example of this, um, and I will not ask you to do these calculations on the test. This is just for illustrative purposes. So um, say, for instance, we have a terminally ill lung cancer patient. Uh, we have Jack Smith here who's on uh, Oxycontin, which is the extended release formulation, 40 milligrams every eight hours. Pretty hefty dose, um, but not uncommon, as you would see with some of your chronic pain patients. So the idea is we want to bring him into the hospital and convert him over into parenteral hydromorphone or Dilaudid, okay? So how we do this is one, we want to determine his total daily dose of drug. So you'd say, okay, he's on 40 milligrams every eight hours, so that's three times a day. So his total is going to be 120 milligrams of oxycodone per day. If he was on kind of uh, PRN breakthrough immediate release oxycodone as well, you would factor that in as well to this calculation. Next, you want to convert this over into oral morphine equivalents. And so if you know that oral oxycodone is roughly one and a half times more potent than morphine, then you can figure out that based on the 120 times 1.5, you see that it is equal to 180 milligrams of oral morphine per day. So presumably, I could switch him over to give him 180 milligrams of morphine per day, and he would be right as rain, right? He would still have the same amount of analgesia coverage as he would have been on the oxycodone. That's kind of the, the idea. At that point, I can then convert him over into uh, IV hydromorphone. And so we see the IV hydromorphone is 20 times more potent, I think I might have misspoke, uh, but 20 times more potent than oral morphine. And so you, then you convert that over, you see that his 180 milligrams of oral morphine is actually equal to about nine milligrams of IV hydromorphone per day, okay? So you can see that you would not want to goof this up and say, well, he's on 120 milligrams of you know morphine orally at home, let's put him on 120 milligrams of IV hydromorphone 
he would be very, very sleepy, right? Um, probably intubated at that point. So you don't want to goof that up. You want to make sure you're looking at and, and doing your conversions appropriately. On the chart, <coughs> on the slide before, mm -hmm. you're not just reading across the whole line. So when you go down to the 120 on oxycodone, you slide over to the left and you get 180 milligrams of morphine. Mm -hmm. But then when you go to the right to the hydromorphone, that's, you don't get nine, you get like 18 milligrams. So h what is the difference and how am I, how is the chart? Uh, right, different? so you, you find little differences everywhere you go. So those charts are not gonna be universal. So that was just like a random one that oh. I pulled off the internet, right? That was just a little Google food there. Um, but like different hospitals will have different um, recommendations depending on who their pain, uh, pain people are. Um, just like, you know, my, my wife who, you know, is a pain specialist, you know, that's what she did her residency in at the VA, uh, would probably have all kinds of different things to say about that. She's like, oh no, obviously, you know, it's not 1.5 times more potent, it's 1.6 times. And well, you know, they, they she can get down to the minutia that I, I just glaze over at some point. I'm just like, I just give them Narcan. That's what I, that's what I say. Um, so, so anyway, it, it, it will be different, but the, in general, the process is you convert it back to oral morphine equivalents and then you change it over to whatever you want. That's kind of the general process you'll see being done. In a table like that, it's uh, easier because you could just kind of slide over and say like, okay, well, I know what the conversion is between oral oxycodone over to IV hydromorphone or something, mm -hmm. right? So that makes it a little bit easier for uh, if you had a chart like that. Yep. So anywho, uh, and then again, you would not necessarily put him on nine milligrams of IV hydromorphone, you know, divided by 24 hours as a continuous infusion. You probably drop that down and say something like six milligrams, right? In order to account for that incomplete cross tolerance. And then if he was still having pain issues and you can bump him up a little bit, say up to, you know, seven or eight or nine, whatever it happens to be in order to get that pain under control. And again, this would be nine milligrams over a 24 hour period. So you'd say divide that into by 24 and to get a continuous infusion per hour, right? So, um, and this is important when we do things like patient controlled analgesia. So you guys have, have, uh, are familiar with PCAs? So what is a PCA? It's the button, right? So basically you'll have a patient who has a continuous infusion uh, of an IV uh, um, uh, opioid, and then they will have a button that they can press uh, in order to give themselves an additional bolus. So um, what are some potential benefits you see of, of doing this? Don't call the nurse every five minutes. Okay, so that could be a positive thing for your nurses. They don't get called every five minutes. What else? Yeah, so subjectively, they can, you know, if they feel like they're in pain, they can hit the button and, and get an extra dose, right? So um, from a patient standpoint, like they're kind of dosing themselves to some degree, and so that's kind of beneficial. So um, it's important to remember the components of a, uh, of a PCA order to make sure you're not gonna accidentally um, forget something and, and really goof up your patient because it's possible to, to have these orders not look correct unless you make sure you have all the, the components uh, available. So the idea is, is that one, you would have a basal rate, which is essentially the continuous infusion of the drug that you would have. So if it's, you know, say 0.5 milligrams of morphine per hour or whatever it happens to be, um, that's gonna be milligrams of whatever drug per hour, okay? Then you're gonna have your on-demand or bolus dosing. So that's gonna be the dose that the patient is gonna hit every time, or get every time they hit the button, okay? Now, does that mean that every time they hit the button they're gonna get a dose of drug? No, right, because then they would lead the, uh, some people accidentally overdosing themselves and, and getting respiratory depression, you don't want that. So there's also gonna be a lockout interval which is gonna be expressed in minutes. So usually you may see, um, you know, you know, whatever their bolus dose is going to be with a lockout of say six minutes or 10 minutes or whatever it happens to be. So you know uh, specifically how many doses it's possible for them to get per hour. And then um, you basically come up with a, a total amount that they're going to get for usually a four hour period is usually how it's uh, kind of written. So um, for example, if you had a morphine PCA, you could say, okay, we're going to do a one milligram per hour basal rate uh, with a half milligram uh, on demand dose every 15 minutes, right? So that means they can only get four additional doses of 0.5 milligrams per hour, um, but that's whenever they want it, right? So if they don't need it, if they're not experiencing pain, they may get less than that, but they'll always get that continuous basal rate. So um, here's an example of what a uh, pain pump looks like. Um, so you, again, you'd have usually the medication or the syringe on the pump itself, uh, and then you would have uh, the, the patient button there. So they would ha basically have it uh, available to them. Um, so what are type of patients um, do you think would not be successful at using one of these? Drug abusers? Okay, why drug abusers? Oh, wait, no, it locks it out, right? But wouldn't they give it every time, like, the lockout? 
Yeah, so maybe if they know what the lockout is, they would be, be hitting every single time. So that's, that's a possibility that might be overusing it. Um, a lot of times these will have uh, some sort of lock feature that hopefully the patient doesn't know about. So if, for instance, um, the ones at, say, Nemours, uh, it's set up to where the, um, the functions can only be changed if you have a key inputted. So the nurses have access to the key, but the patient doesn't, so they can't go <laughs> in and program their own stuff, right? Because some of these guys are pretty savvy and they, 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 they kind of know what's up. Um, I've seen other ones where there's actually a button on the back of the pump that you can hold down and that will actually lock it out to prevent anyone from changing the, the orders until you know someone went and unlocked it. Um, so there's different features to try to uh, deter abuse from that standpoint. But what other type of patients might be um, ill-suited to use this? Yeah, so very young patients uh, would be one. So that would be one where they don't necessarily understand. Um, they're just in pain and they don't really know what's going on. So they would not be good to use it. Quadriplegic, so someone who could not use their hands uh, would definitely be someone who uh, would not be successful with that. Any other patients? Yeah, altered mental status or dementia. So, so again, if they do not have the mental faculties in order to understand or to push the button, um, they're not going to do very well for that. And so in those cases, sometimes you'll end up seeing that they'll just be put on a basal rate or a continuous infusion of drug, and then they'll have PRN orders for the nurse to uh, administer a drug outside of that. Right. So that way the nurse is assessing for pain and they can give the drug based on what their assessments are going to be. Um, Sometimes you run into problems as well where like the family wants to take care of the patient and so they will go and um, you know potentially start hitting the button for them. You know, like, oh my child's in pain or so and so is in pain, like I can just tell, I can just see it in their face and so they keep hitting the button. And so sometimes they may not be making super objective assessments of those patients, right? Because they're again they're concerned about them, they, they just want them to, to feel better. They may not understand some of the problems with that. So um, those are some of the drawbacks on the patients who may not do super well um, with those. Um, I've also um, based on how they're hitting the button, you can also use this to adjust your, your dosing, right? So for instance, if you have a patient who is um, not having their pain well controlled, say they're post-op, uh, they've had orthopedic surgery and they're on one of these. And so what's a way you could assess to see, just based on the pump, um, that their pain is not under control? Absolutely. So how often they're hitting that button. And so that uh, the pump will actually track that and you'll actually be able to see how often they're hitting the button, say per hour or during a, a four hour time period. So the idea is, is that you can basically um, take whatever they've been getting for that time period and now make that their new basal rate. So if they hit it every single 15 minutes, they're hitting that button to get their dose. You can then now add that onto their basal rate and then have them have a new additional bolus dose, right? So that way um, you hopefully get to a nice mi middle ground where they're not having to hit the button all the time. It's only every once in a while and their pain is kind of being well controlled at, at a baseline rate. That makes sense? So again, you're constantly reassessing it, trying to figure out what the patient actually needs. Um, and we actually had some kids um, in the hospital that were very funny because they would just, they want to play with the button, right? So they're like, you know, the, the kid was totally fine, but the nurse was like, well, he hit it like 470 times uh, in this hour. I don't, I don't think he's in that much pain. He's like, no, he just, he likes playing with buttons. So, um, so take it with a grain of salt, you know, uh, assess your patient, make sure that's actually legitimate. So um, one of the things I noticed, and, and so I kind of want to assess this on, um, so I went out on, on uh, some site visits and I noticed that um, you guys probably don't have a lot of exposure to this, but um, how you write a PCA order is important because you want to make sure you have all of the components. And so again, um, as an example, you'd want to have uh, your order of a morphine, IV PCA, it could be hydromorphone, could be fentanyl, could be any one of these IV opioids. Um, you have your basal drug rate, which is what they're getting per hour. You have your demand dose, which needs to be expressed there as well. And then you have your lockout interval. So again, this could be every six minutes, every 10 minutes, every 15, whatever you want it to be. Um, and then the other final component you have is going to be the total amount that you're gonna get per four hours. So for instance, here in this example, um, the patient's getting a basal rate. So you know they're getting one milligram for, per hour. So you know for a four hour period, they get four milligrams, right? And then you add up what their total could be if they got every single um, bolus dose on top of that. And so basically, you know, if they could get every 15 minutes for four hours, that's 16 doses, multiply that by 0.5 and add that all together and you get 12. Okay, so it's important to make sure you add that on there and make sure all your math adds up because um, otherwise you're gonna get calls from the pharmacist being like, oh, this doesn't really make sense or you know, what did you mean to give them something else as far as their bolus dose or their basal, whatever it happens to be. So these are the components you wanna have to make sure your, your order looks correct, okay? Okay, um, so again, when you have patients with persistent pain, you wanna make sure you have a basal rate plus the PCA on demand dose. This is gonna be most effective for your patients. Um, but again, if they are only having intermittent pain, uh, then you may not need this. Maybe you only need, say, as needed um, oral medications or something. They may, they may not need that continuous basal rate. Um, and so we've had some cases where um, patients who are, are only having intermittent pain, they won't have a basal rate being put on there. So they'll get zero milligrams per hour, but they'll just have a bolus dose they can give themselves. So that's kind of one thing you can do with that. Um, 
And typically, you'll see the on-demand dose uh, being approximately a quarter to a third of what that basal rate is per hour in most cases. So you'll see some differences depending on the patient, but um, that's a kind of a general rule of thumb. And then um, your adjustments should be made on the actual PCA usage. So again, if your patient's hitting you the button every single time uh, that a dose is now up, um, you want to adjust based on that. Or if they're not using it very much at all, then maybe decrease your basal rate so they're not getting quite so much um, during that time period, right? So that way they are going to be at a, a nice point where their pain is managed, but they're not uh, at risk for adverse side effects. Okay. So what are those adverse effects? We've alluded to quite a few of them. Um, first one being uh, the frequent one. So constipation is going to be almost universal for patients who are receiving opioids. Um, some patients will see some nausea, vomiting uh, associated with these. Uh, some people respond better to one drug versus another. I know a lot of people who take hydrocodone and they say this stuff's terrible, it just made me sick. I did, I'd rather be in pain than have to deal with that. Um, but if you switch them over to something else, like say some, something like fentanyl, um, they might do a lot better with it. Right, so just be aware there's some interpatient variability there, um, but the constipation is going to be almost universal, right? Because by acting on those mu receptors within the GI tract, it uh, decreases peristalsis, and you can see some very significant constipation. So, um, again, we mentioned uh, histamine release. Uh, you can switch drugs, but uh, those with, uh, from the morphine family are going to have more likely to have that histamine release. So again, probably switching agents is going to be the best thing for them. Is that why uh, meth addicts have like runny noses? No, because methadone doesn't really cause a lot of histamine release. Sometimes if you are having um, withdrawal from some of those, you will end up seeing kind of um, rebound, kind of um, discharge and things like that. So sometimes you can see it because of that. Okay. Yeah. I more often see the, the runny nose and stuff with um, something like cocaine. Not yeah, so I, I assume you're talking about methadone or something. but. Um, yeah, so uh, stimulants, you can also see that as well. So if you imagine like if you're abusing something like cocaine, which is um, stimulating vasoconstriction, especially in the nose, if you were to take that away, all of a sudden those uh, blood vessels start to dilate as well, and so you get that runny nose uh, from that perspective. So anywho, um, so again, less frequently, you can see, again, it will be ultramental status and delirium, and you also worry about that risk of respiratory depression. This is more frequently seen if you have patients who are um, abusing the meds or taking higher doses than what they should be, especially if there's any kind of med error that was being made, relatively low risk if you're just using normal dosing. Um, but remember when we talked about those kids who had uh, ultra rapid metabolizing CYP2B6 and they converted all that codeine over into morphine, especially when they're post-op after their TNA and their throats are kind of swollen, um, they saw deaths associated with that. And so um, really the big thing you see with opioids is that they don't really um, when they cause respiratory depression, it's not necessarily that it's um, your body's not sensing when it doesn't have enough oxygen. It's actually blunting the effects of too much CO2 on the brain, right? And so um, a very good example of this is um, some of the, the ER residents I used to work with, they got really bored during some night shifts, and so they would play a game called DSAT, where essentially they would put pulse oxes on themselves and hold their breath and see who could get their pulse ox the lowest <laughs> before they almost passed out. And so what you actually find is it's very difficult to actually get your oxygen saturations to decrease because it's not really your brain's sensing too little O2 because you have a pretty good reserve of that in your hemoglobin. It's usually the, the rise in CO2 that your brain is responding to first. And so with these opioids, you're blocking that response. And so with these little kids who are converting all that codeine to morphine, um, even though they were obstructed and they weren't really able to expel that CO2, their brains didn't really sense it because the opioids were on board to blunt that response. And so that's where that respiratory depression really comes from in that uh, situation. So, um, and then again, worry about the risk of, of abuse and diversion, especially if patients are not having their pain adequately managed. This is leading them more often to self-medicate or to use doses that are inappropriate for them, uh, and they can run into some problems with that. Diversion? Diversion, what is diversion? Does anyone know? Yeah, so um, for instance, if uh, you can see this with healthcare providers. So again, they say, oh, I gave my patient two milligrams of morphine, but really they just gave it to themselves potentially, you know, spit out into a cup and they gave their patient saline. Um, it happened with healthcare providers, it happened with patients. Um, so one of the things that we saw with um, some of our pain management clinics is that you would drug test patients to make sure, um, th to see what was popping positive. So for instance, if you're treating your patient's chronic back pain with hydrocodone, uh, and they came back and they did a urine drug screen and they were totally negative for hydrocodone, what would that lead you to believe? Hmm? They're, not They're not taking it. So what could they be doing with it? 
Selling it, absolutely. So selling it for the drug, uh, their you know, drug du jour. So maybe it's cocaine for them, or maybe it's um, you know some methamphetamines or something like that. So oftentimes you actually are uh, measuring blood levels or urine levels to make sure they're actually taking the drug that they're supposed to be taking. Um, my wife told me a very funny story when she was having to deal with the, the substance abuse clinic, and they would have these um, old older vets who would um, you know come in for their medication you know pretty regularly, and of course they'd have to you know be in, you know get their pain assessed and all that kind of stuff to make sure this stuff's working for them. But he had this one. Um, really old guy was um, very um, not the not the most handsome old man you'd ever want to see, but he came in a rascal scooter, uh, you know, every time to get his refill. And he had just the the most beautiful young lady you'd ever want to see on his lap every single time. He came rolling in the scooter, had this beautiful young lady. And so eventually, when he um, got his uh, source of methadone taken away and they switched him over to something less uh, valuable, um, she stopped coming along with him. <laughs> very very sad. But um, people do a lot of crazy things for these drugs. Um, you were about selling them, which is you know diversion. You were about them. You know, someone um, instead of the patients getting it, you know, someone else is getting it. So sometimes it's very sad. You'll see some of these you know chronic um, sickle cell patients who are coming in for you know recurrent you know acute pain issues, and it's not necessarily that their pain's not being well controlled, but the parents are taking the drugs instead. Right, mm -hmm. so you're in some really kind of nasty kind of family dynamic issues there. Um, but yeah, so diversion can be a really big issue. So again, is your patient's pain not being managed because their drugs aren't working for them, or because they're not actually getting a chance to take them? So that could be a question you have to ask yourself. So um, how do we minimize some of these adverse effects? So again, titrate gradually and start low and go slow if it's uh, therapeutically appropriate. And then also determine the cause of symptoms. So again, you know, if they were having a lot of itching and pruritus associated with their morphine usage, is it necessary that they're CNS depressed because of that or because now they're starting to pre-medicate with Benadryl, right? So there could be some additive effects you see with other drugs that could be uh, interfering. Um, you can potentially a avoid some of these adverse effects in, by switching over to a different opioids. So you just kind of have to play that by ear and see what they do. Um, but again, you will never really see tolerance develop to the constipation. So it's a very good idea to put your patients on prophylactic um, uh, laxatives in order to help make sure they, that is not going to be a big issue for them. So sometimes we will say mush and push um, because you actually want to have two components of that. Want something to uh, some sort of emollient in order to uh, work to soften the stool and then a stimulant in order to help uh, increase peristalsis to kind of push things through, right? So we'll talk more about that in the GI section, but it's very important to, that these guys are on a kind of prophylactic bowel regimen if they're going to be on these meds chronically in order to avoid that. Is that medication I keep seeing a commercial for? more helpful than other laxatives? There's one like specifically for opioid mm -hmm. constipation. We'll talk about that. Okay. Um, the, potentially that could be more effective because it's dealing with the, the, the root problem, right? The problem is you have these opioids sitting on these uh, mu receptors on the GI tract, slowing everything down. Um, so if there was something that could come along and block that effect, then potentially that could, that could really be a good thing, right? So um, we'll look at uh, those meds in just a few minutes. Okay, so again, um, we mentioned kind of what the point of this is, uh, or where, where a lot of the constipation is coming from, but again, recommend they're increasing fiber and fluid intake, um, as we mentioned, that, that bowel regimen. So adding on a uh, stool softener plus a stimulant laxative, again, we'll cover that in GI, um, can help to, to avoid some of this. And it's kind of crazy, because we, you know, my wife would see these older uh, kind of end-stage palliative care patients, um, and they would just be very agitated, you know, their, their dementia was getting worse, and they couldn't really figure out what was going on. The pain was definitely out of control, um, and it turns out they just really needed a bowel clean out and then once you were able to clean them out all of a sudden they felt a lot better their their mental status started to improve a little bit so um, never underestimate the need to have a good poop uh, for your patients certainly um, starting my baby on solids I can recognize that fact for myself because this is she is one cranky baby if she's not gone in a few days. So, um, so again, monitor closely. You know, uh, you may need to add additional laxatives potentially. So, especially an osmotic product like uh, a Miralax or something like that can be uh, beneficial as well. Okay, so opioid antagonists. So what happens if we have too much opioid effect around? How do we block that? And so I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of the drug Narcan or Naloxone. That's one of our main go-to drugs in order to reverse the effects of uh, opioid intoxication. And so again, if your patient is uh, significantly respiratory depressed or CNS depressed, you can give this drug in order to reverse them. Uh, has anyone ever seen someone get Narcan? What does it look like? Come back from the dead. Come back from the dead? Yeah, yeah how quick does it work? 
fast, very, very fast. So um, if you guys, uh, there's a movie, I think with like Nicolas Cage and Ving Rhames, just called like, Bringing Out the Dead, where there are a couple of paramedics, and they do this nice like, exorcism scene where they give a guy Narcan. Um, so go watch that, and that's exactly what it looks like. So you can have a patient who's completely comatose, on the verge of being intubated, you give them a dose of Narcan, and they will wake up just like that. Um, usually in total withdrawal, and they are very pissed off that you uh, reverse all, all those opioid effects. And so, um, that can be another kind of uh, negative point. So dosing is gonna be really important when looking at um, giving something like naloxone. But the point is, is that naloxone will kick the opioids off of that receptor and they act as an antagonist. So it basically blocks the receptor from the opioids working. And so very rapidly you can have a return to normal CNS function, normal respiratory function um, after even one dose. So this drug is not given orally because it does not get absorbed very well, which is why you can give it with something like buprenorphine and have that suboxone. So that way it actually deters IV abuse because the drug doesn't get absorbed orally, but if you were to inject it, then you potentially have that antagonist effect uh, working against you. But um, lots of other routes we can give this. We can give it uh, via intravenous route, which is probably the most common, um, in intramuscular route. This is actually a new product called Evzio, which is very similar to a uh, EpiPen. Uh, and this one actually talks to you as well. And so the idea is you train um, other people around the patient that if they do have an adverse effect, if they do become especially CNS or uh, respiratory depressed, they can actually administer this intramuscularly. Because again, if, uh, if you're opioid overdosed at that point, um, it's not going to be very easy for you to give yourself a dose of this medication, not very coordinated. So someone else would end up having to give this to you. But it goes through all the instructions. You basically pull off the top and it says, okay, apply this to the thigh and then you know, push down and, and inject the medication. And so there's also kind of expanded programs as well where more people are getting, um, they're being given doses of naloxone as kind of a prophylactic. And so some people are worried that this enables drug abuse, but in a lot of cases you see decreased uh, opioid deaths, which is probably gonna be a net positive for society in the long run. So uh, you may see some controversy about that. Um, the intranasal route is kind of interesting because I've seen some patients, uh, and this could even be inhaled, so um, some things I've even seen is where you actually put naloxone into a, a nebulizer cup, like meant for you know, nebulizing things like albuterol, and you actually put that on the patient and they kind of passively start to inhale the drug and then as they kind of wake up they'll pull the mask off and then they'll kind of resedate themselves and then they'll put the mask back on and they'll kind of wake back up. And so it's kind of a nice kind of self-titrating uh, dose of, of naloxone because the big drawback to giving this drug is you put your patients in, into withdrawal if you give too much. Right? So if you take all those uh, opioids off the receptors, they go into withdrawal, they get super nauseous, they're going to throw up, they're going to have diarrhea, they're going to be sweating, they're going to be fighting you, um, and they're not really going to be, your nurse is going to hate you, right? So the um, big thing to remember there is that you can start with lower doses and gently titrate up in order to achieve just kind of the perfect balance where they're breathing, but they're not necessarily um, in a very uh, kind of angry mood that you reverse all their drugs, right? So the ideal way to give naloxone is to start with low doses until they start to yawn, that's the kind of point where you know that they have a good respiratory drive and they can uh, protect their own airway. So if you see them yawning, that's usually a good sign. Um, there are a couple of other agents you can give as well. Um, so again, this drug works, naloxone works because it crosses the blood brain barrier and blocks those centrally working mu receptors. We have a couple of drugs that you can give uh, that have kind of permanent charges on them that uh, allow them to not cross a blood brain barrier. And these are gonna be better for opioid induced constipation. So uh, if you see that OIC, so I guess some of those commercials are going to be for, um, these are drugs that do not cross the, the uh, blood-brain barrier. They work only on the GI tract to help relieve that. And so um, you have drugs like alvimapan, methylnaltraxone, and uh, naloxagol um, are all going to work very similarly to one another. Um, you don't really see the withdrawal effects because of the fact that they're not getting into the CNS. They're only going to work on the, on the GI tract. And so these are going to be much more expensive. And so potentially if the constipation is not being relieved by using kind of more normal methods, that kind of motion push uh, tactic, um, these might be uh, indicated for your patients. Sometimes you'll see these being used more in the post-operative setting in order to help kind of stimulate someone's GI tract because that's one kind of one of your, your indicators like, hey, are they you know, passing gas? Are they you know, able to um, have a good functioning GI tract you know, before you send them home? Yeah, so that's a very, really good question, right? Because, you know, if you're just normally taking this for, you know, I got my wisdom teeth taken out, that doesn't really make sense, right? Because you're kind of low risk for uh, uh, having an overdose like that. These are more for abuse patients. or patients who are high risk or, say, for instance, they are trying to um, kick their opioid habit. And, you know, say they're on, like, on a methadone program or a buprenorphine program, um, but they're high risk for relapse. And, again, very frequently you'll see these patients, especially... 
Um, so one of the problems you run into is it's, uh, especially someone that's kind of titrated off of their, say heroin's their, their drug of choice, and they kind of titrate off of that, and they're doing good for a while, <laughs> um, but then they relapse and they relapse at the same dose that they were on beforehand, right? They don't take into account that they worked up to that dose over a long period of time. So they take that again, they're much more likely to have just, you know, complete, uh, you know, uh, uh, CNS respiratory depression, they're obtunded. Um, someone else needs to really kind of save their life at that point. So um, that's where this drug could come into to hand, uh, come to play. You know, I don't know necessarily how the insurance cover that or who they're gonna cover it for, but um, it's definitely kind of an interesting uh, medication that's uh, available for that use specifically. Hmm? I know they give it, and in some places they're trying to give it to people who leave jail. Um, but I think it's just given free from the county and stuff, non yeah. insurance. Yeah, well, something like this is very expensive, the actual product. So this mm -hmm. would have to be probably gotten through a pharmacy and through actual. Um, insurance you need know, to pay for otherwise it's gonna be super expensive but if you're giving like a like intranasal kits mm -hmm. um, that is much more cost effective because naloxone is pretty cheap uh, it's just a matter of how the patients are going to give it and so if you're imagining um, if it's a, a friend or a loved one who's going to need to administer this you don't want them to necessarily have to worry about drawing up a dose and giving an IV, you know IM shot or something mm -hmm. um, that's going to lead to you know prolonged downtime and, and anoxia um, but giving an intranasal dose very easy right you can just stick it up the nose spray it and, and hope get some return to hopefully they've called 911 as well right that's the other key thing you're hoping for is they've called 911 so um, so yeah that's kind of the use case and so it's very controversial because some people think that you know you're doing you know more harm by uh, kind of enforcing bad behaviors but other people think you're saving lives so um, you'll probably see more of these programs kind of spread out as, as time goes on so there's really cool stuff going on like up in Canada and whatnot where they have like actual direct observe um, facilities where you can actually go in and get clean needles, get clean um, supplies. You bring the drugs yourself, but there's like a trained nurse and a doctor who's in house that will, um, you know, if you do have a problem, they can at least, you can, you're doing it somewhere where they can see you and they can get help, you know, immediately. Um, and they even have like little chill out rooms and they have like, you know, work placement stuff on the second floor and, re, you know, rehab facilities and things like that. So um, it's kind of all kind of one-stop shopping. But the idea is, is to decrease the harm that, you know, using things like dirty needles is going to have and, and accidental overdoses. So they have people trying to get clean at the same place where they have active drug users with active yeah, because essentially, you know, so uh, it's kind of a, a tangent, but, you know, basically um, there's one, I think it was, I think it was Toronto, either Toronto or Vancouver. Um, but essentially what they were seeing is that, especially in some of these really na uh, bad neighborhoods, the, the the opioid death rate and the the transmission of things like HIV, Hep C, were really concentrated in this one area. And so they started up some of these um, places where people can go in and get clean supplies. They can be directly observed. Um, so you start to see transmission of, of uh, those diseases go down significantly, so less, fewer deaths. And then at the same time, they say, hey, whenever you're ready to quit, why don't you walk upstairs? You know, they can give you the, the resources in order to help start, start that. They can find you places to live. They can find you uh, places to work in order to help, um, you know, increase your chance of success for kicking that stuff, right? So the idea is harm reduction versus just saying, well, don't do that. Drugs are bad because that oftentimes doesn't work. So, um, you know, you can get away with a lot more stuff in Canada than you can here, but it'll be interesting to see kind of what how things go on as, as time progresses. So... Anyway, be very careful with your dosing of naloxone. Don't give too much right off the bat. And um, you'll actually even find that some drugs work, um, require higher doses of naloxone. Um, so for instance, you know, things that are very um, naturally occurring, or things like morphine, things like heroin, they reverse very easily from, um, from naloxone versus things that are more synthetic. So things like buprenorphine, you need much higher doses to kick it off. And it's basically it has to do with the receptor affinity. And so um, some of the things you'll see is the actual dosing of naloxone may change based on where you're practicing. So for instance, if you're up in New York, you're going to see a lot more heroin. And there they use very, very low doses, especially with the heroin addicts, they start very, very low dose in order to help just gently reverse that so they start breathing again. Down here, you have a lot more prescription uh, opioid abuse, especially before a lot of those pill mills stop. And so we need a higher doses in order to help reverse those effects. Because you give them, say, 0.4 milligrams, and nothing would happen. You have to give them up to 10 milligrams in order to actually see any effect. Um, so just be aware that you know, the dosing is going to change based on kind of the patient you're dealing with. Uh, but giving too much can definitely be a problem. Okay. So moving on, uh, we will talk about some other adjuvant medications. Uh, and so we'll see that many chronic pain conditions respond pretty well to adjuvant drugs, um, particularly when you're dealing with neuropathic pain. Um, so some of the drugs we'll see being used here include some anticonvulsants. Uh, we'll talk about lidocaine and other uh, um, local anesthetics, and then also things like tricyclic antidepressants, which um, some of these we'll talk about in, in future lectures. Um, you'll see that response is pretty variable. 
And so, um, excuse me. So that patients um, who don't respond well to one class may um, respond well to another one. So again, it's, it's worthwhile that you know if they don't work very well the TCA, you switch them over to, to one of the anticonvulsants. They may work better with that. So um, some other uh, medications you're going to see. We'll talk about a few of these, um, but certainly things like skeletal muscle relaxants can help, especially if you have patients who have really kind of big spastic, uh, spasticity issues. Um, you'll see things like uh, tramadol, which is kind of an opioid, which we'll talk about a little bit, uh, and even things like capsaicin. Does anyone know where you find capsaicin normally? Hot peppers. Hot peppers, yeah, absolutely. So capsaicin can actually be utilized uh, as, as a pain treatment as well. Um, even, um, you know, especially not just for cosmetic use, but you can even use botulinum toxin or Botox in order to help uh, deal with uh, some spastic conditions and also make them look 10 years younger, right? Um, and then we'll even talk about medical marijuana because that is a hot new topic, right? Absolutely. All right, so um, some of the anti-epileptics, we'll get more into detail on this when we go into the um, neurology section, but uh, basically um, we've seen these to be pretty effective in, in many neuropathic uh, pain conditions. Lots of different ones we can utilize like carbamazepine, gabapentin, lamotrigine. Um, key thing to note with these is that they all work to kind of slow the CNS. Um, they're going to have additive uh, CNS depressant effects with a lot of your opioids. So again, you want to start with low doses and kind of gently titrate up to see how they respond to this. Um, giving too much is just going to lead to way overdoing it on the CNS depression and can lead to kind of premature failure of therapy before you're really getting a chance to, to work. Um, again, we'll talk more about these drugs in, in detail, so here we'll just kind of mention them briefly. But um, the tricyclic antidepressants, these are working to block the reuptake of things like norepinephrine um, in the CNS, which actually helps to modulate pain. And so for a lot of chronic pain conditions uh, that are neuropathic in origin, like fibromyalgia, um, diabetic neuropathies, things like that, um, TCAs be considered one of the kind of the gold standard drugs uh, to use for them. Um, the use is also pretty limited uh, due to a lot of their side effects. We'll see that they work on a lot of different receptors, but um, namely they have a lot of anticholinergic effects, which can be problematic for your older patients and kind of lead to further mental status alterations and, and things like that. So that can be a, a problem for some of them. Uh, another good one uh, that can be utilized are going to be local anesthetics. We'll probably talk about more of this in the surgery section, but um, these are also useful for neuropathic pain and also for some acute pain conditions. And so um, basically the way that these drugs work are by blocking sodium channels along the nerve. So for instance, um, say for instance you have uh, your... You have your tissue here, which is uh, being painful, you know, it, it's in pain right now, you know, you have a laceration or whatever it happens to be. Um, those pain signals get transmitted up the neuron and they're going along that um, kind of jumping between those uh, bits uh, in between the myelin sheath, right? And so that's all being mediated via sodium channels, propagating that action potential. So the idea here is if you block those sodium channels, you prevent that action potential from being transmitted up through the CNS and you don't feel that pain anymore. So that's basically how it pro uh, provides that amount of, of anesthesia there, right? So by doing that, um, we can have local uh, effects on um, sites of pain. You don't want to use these systemically in, for the most part because you will run into some issues, which we'll talk about. Um, but very commonly, you'll see things like um, Imla cream, which is a combination of lidocaine and prilocaine that can be used for things like um, needle stick analgesia. That's a big thing we see a lot in kids is that um, fear of needles is huge. And so if you can do anything to limit the amount of pain they're experiencing, um, that's going to be good for them. So we use uh, uh, anesthetic creams to help mitigate that. Um, you can even see lidoderm patches, which is lidocaine that can be applied um, to specific areas to provide some anesthesia uh, to those sites. And then we mentioned uh, epidurals previously where you use things like bupivacaine being applied in the epidural space to kind of decrease um, sensation from whole regions of the body. So you can do kind of regional blocks as well. And one of the big things I see that's very useful, um, we have kids that will come in for lacerations. So for instance, um, say you have a nasty finger laceration that you want to sew up. Um, I can give you a lot of opioids in order to help deal with that pain, but instead what I can actually do is give a bupivacaine digital block which will actually just be uh, applied directly at the, at the base of the finger, they'll end up numbing up the entire thing. And bupivacaine is a drug that has a very long half-life, so they'll actually be numb for like two days and won't really need any kind of pain medication for that. So that can be a very beneficial thing that is definitely opioid sparing in a lot of cases. Um, you can also see like uh, more regional blocks, so sometimes you'll see, you know, um, especially after orthopedic surgery, like knee replacements and hip replacements, whole areas of those will be blocked with some of these local anesthetics in order to help decrease the amount of pain the uh, patient is sen sensing and decrease the amount of opioids they need to receive. So that can be another beneficial thing there. Um, big adverse effects you see from these um, 
local anesthetics is that they get infiltrated into the systemic circulation, they're very, very cardiotoxic because they block all sodium channels, including on the heart. And so we already mentioned that lidocaine can be used as an antiarrhythmic, um, but something like bupivacaine is very, very uh, potentially fatal if uh, it gets to the heart shuts down all the sodium channels, you basically get put into asystole very quickly. So um, that's one of the things to definitely be, um, be cognizant of. Any questions from the break? Anything at all? All right, so um, we will continue with the skeletal muscle relaxants. And so this is probably the big place we'll talk about these drugs here. Um, quite a variety of them. So you have things, uh, some of which you may have heard about, things like Fluxaril or Cyclobenzaprine, Baclofen, um, some other ones. Um, these primarily work uh, to help we, with patients who have kind of more spastic issues. So if you had like um, um, any particular kind of could be nerve damage or it could be other things where basically the, the muscle is just tensing up and, and causing significant pain. These drugs can work for that. And so they primarily work by agonizing GABA B receptors. And so uh, you guys have heard of GABA, I'm sure, right? What does GABA normally do in the brain? Inhibitory. It's inhibitory, right? So the major inhibitory neurotransmitter. And so um, you'll see that a lot of things like our um, benzodiazepines work on GABA A receptors. These are working specifically on GABA B receptors. So the idea is, is they work centrally, they increase chloride flow, and they hyperpolarize a lot of those neurons to try to keep them from, from firing. And so ideally, if you were looking to use a muscle relaxant, you'd want things that work peripherally, uh, working specifically on the muscle. This is really working more up in the CNS, but it's kind of the best thing we have. And so as you might imagine, by influencing these GABA receptors, the side effects that go along with these are pretty, uh, pretty easy to figure out. So um, biggest thing you're gonna see is drowsiness associated with these. And so if you imagine putting these drugs on board on top of an opioid, um, you can see some synergistic effects on that drowsiness there. So um, again, make sure your patients aren't operating machinery after taking these drugs, especially for the first few doses, um, because they can uh, have some significant CNS effects. But they can help, uh, especially with patients who are doing like kind of physical therapy or physical rehabilitation, um, help them to regain some function uh, and allow them to uh, have better you know, use of their limbs. So it can be uh, useful drugs there. Uh, next we have capsaicin, which we uh, alluded to being found in many hot peppers. Um, does anyone know what to do if you accidentally get some hot peppers on your skin or say in your eyes or something? Vinegar? Vinegar? Hmm, I haven't seen wax use before. You want to use fats, essentially. Um, you want to use things that will help uh, because this is a, a very lipophilic um, molecule. It goes through skin very well, but it can also be taken off by partitioning into f uh, a fat layer. So uh, essentially uh, by using things like olive oil or mayonnaise or anything else that has a high fat content, you can actually help to deal with that. So you know, frequently uh, if we have patients who have say been hit by like pepper spray, or had an accidental, um, uh, that accidentally going off, or if you are cutting jalapenos or something and you get that on, on your skin or something like that can be something useful um, to help deal with that. The way it works for pain though, is it actually helps to uh, first fire off those fibers. So initially it causes pain, but it helps to release uh, this thing called substance P, which helps to sensitize a lot of those fibers to pain. And so by giving it consistently and giving it chronically, you end up depleting those nerves of substance P. And so they really don't have anything else to fire off with. And so it helps to decrease pain that way. So this is uh, good for localized pain conditions. Um, it is um, good only if it's used consistently and used for long periods of time. I can't just use this once and expect to get any therapeutic benefit, which is why compliance is pretty uh, poor with this drug. Um, but it does work very well for those that have a localized effect uh, if they use it consistently. Of course, the big thing they need to uh, be worried about is if they, uh, you know, they need to wash their hands really well after using it, because otherwise if you do the thing that I always do when I'm cutting jalapenos and, you know, rub your eye, of course, um, it's not going to be a good time for them, right? So be aware, make sure they're washing their hands well, um, and just be aware that they, uh, let them know that the stinging and the pain is going to go away over time. Um, don't stop use of it too early. Since it's long acting, though, can it cause, like, potential permanent um, damage to nerve fibers? I haven't seen anything where it uh, causes permanent damage because as soon as you stop using it, um, that substance P will start to re uh, replace itself. And so it'll start to build up those normal stores again. Yeah. Good question though. Okay, so another drug which is opioid-like is tramadol, otherwise known as Ultram. Um, this one is actually kind of a weak mu agonist, so it kind of works uh, a little bit at the opioid receptors um, and is used for more kind of moderate, maybe uh, moderately severe pain. But this isn't really going to give you the same kind of bang for your buck as you see with something like uh, morphine or an oxycodone. Um, some of the benefits uh, that it has for working on neuropathic pains, it actually helps to block reuptake of things like norepinephrine and serotonin, that 5-HT. 
So by doing that, um, it's thought to help with some neuropathic pain issues. It's not going to be, um, uh, it's thought to be better tolerated than some opioids uh, because of the fact that it does not have full agonist effects of those opioid receptors. Um, so for a long time, we thought that, you know, no one really abused this drug. This drug is, is very safe to use, um, no abuse potential. And so it was not uh, put as a scheduled substance. It used to not have any kind of uh, federal scheduling. Um, but then people started to abuse it. And of course, you know, a few bad apples ruined the, everything. Um, and so recently it actually was made a C4. So this one you do need to have, um, you, know, you do have some of those regulations now being placed on that now that it's not a, uh, now that it is a controlled substance. So, um, and again, as you might imagine, with uh, some of the very similar side effects to what you see with some of the other opioids, you know, constipation, some dizziness, things like that, you can certainly see with that. Um, sometimes you'll see it co-formulated with uh, acetaminophen, and that's that ultra set there, you see. So, next thing we'll talk about is medical marijuana. So, this is uh, finally Morgan & Morgan did it. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? So again, we, we saw that this was uh, passed uh, last November. And so basically, uh, and, and I put some articles up on the site um, that you can review. Uh, this is kind of where I pulled some of this information from about its uh, potential therapeutic uses. Um, so the law that came out basically said that, uh, you know, the following um, conditions can be considered uh, for use of medical marijuana. And so you can see things like cancer, epilepsy, glaucoma, HIV, PTSD, which I thought was kind of broad spectrum. I mean, you guys could say, hey, I took Farm 2 with uh, Dr. Wood, and they would say, oh, yeah, you got PTSD. Um, <laughs> But lots of different conditions here that were listed. And then kind of the, the nice uh, nebulous uh, statement at the bottom, other debilitating conditions uh, of the same kind or class. Um, and basically, you know, any, anywhere that the, the provider feels that the benefits would outweigh the risk. Okay. And so I saw just recently an article was put out where they said, here are the doctors in, in Central Florida who have done the course. Basically, it's a, uh, I believe it's like an eight hour seminar they have to do, pass a test, and then pay like $1,000. And they're, they're listed as um, competent to, to prescribe medical marijuana. So um, quite a few providers have, have already gone through that process. Uh, I'm not sure as far as dispensaries go, who is going to be allowed to do that. Um, so that may be, remain to be seen, unless I have not looked it up very well. So medical marijuana, how does it work? Uh, essentially, it is a very complex molecule, but uh, we believe that uh, the main plant this comes from is going to be cannabis sativa. This is the main one. There's a couple other cannabis plants out there, but this is the main one we're going to be using. Um, lots of different cannabinoids that it has, um, but the primary one we see being used is this delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. So I'm sure everyone's heard of THC before, right? Absolutely, I'm sure. Um, so this is the main psychoactive compound. So this is the main one where you see the euphoria. This is where you get a lot of the, the munchies from. This is where you get all those other effects you expect to see from a typical person who is using marijuana. Um, there's a few other uh, products as well. There's one called cannabidiol. This one is especially useful for some forms of epilepsy. When uh, we did have some limited medical marijuana use in Florida prior to this law being passed, and it was for a particular strain called Charlotte's Web that had very low THC contents but high cannabidiol. And so this is the molecule thought to be effective for treating epilepsy. So nowadays, uh, uh, just regular strains of cannabis sativa can be used that has the, the THC, because this is what we think is going to be useful for some of these other conditions we'll, we'll talk about. Um, the brain primarily has two cannabinoid receptors, going to be CB1 and CB2, just stands for cannabinoid 1 and cannabinoid 2. Um, primarily, we're going to see the main psychoactive effects from CB1. That's the main thing we're going to be seeing with a lot of the euphoria and, and other effects we expect to see. Um, it affects lots of other neurotransmitters, but really the main thing just to focus on is the THC, working with the CB1 receptor. So um, what are some of the risks of using medical marijuana? I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with some of these, but acutely, you can see some problems with impaired short memory, uh, motor coordination, and judgment. Um, so certainly no driving under the influence of, of marijuana. We'd see that, you know, um, Really, uh, even though patients will have medical marijuana cards, whatever it happens to be, to say, hey, I can, I'm okay to be using this, that does not mean they're okay to drive, and so they can still get the same you know, driving under the influence um, charges as anyone would with alcohol or anything else. Um, so just let them know, hey, don't, don't go driving with this stuff on board. Rarely, though, you can see, um, you know, people having some paranoid ideations, some psychotic symptoms. Usually you see this more in patients with kind of underlying psychologic um, backgrounds. Um, chronically, we don't have a ton of information about what the, the main chronic effects are going to be, but we do believe that uh, it affects some developing brains. So there may be some impaired memory or lower IQ for some patients who have used this chronically during their developmental stages. So um, not only that, but it can exacerbate things like anxiety, depression, psychotic illnesses, as I mentioned uh, previously. So um, 
And the big thing to worry about, especially when you are looking at uh, inhaled use, because again, this is, you know, we're superheating uh, these compounds, inhaling is very hot gas. So uh, kind of the same things would apply as you see with smoking uh, nicotine is that, you know, uh, increased risk for things like bronchitis and pneumonias. So, you know, obviously if you're taking these drugs orally, uh, you're not gonna see the same problem. But uh, and then there's also some possible association with MI stroke and peripheral vascular disease. So they're kind of things we've seen reported within the literature itself. But um, so I went ahead and looked to see what is the actual evidence out there for use of medical marijuana in some of these conditions. And so I found a good meta-analysis, which you guys know what a meta-analysis is, right? Yeah, from EpiBio, you guys remember that class? Or have repressed those memories? <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically we're taking all the studies that are being uh, done out there on a particular subject and trying to um, use all that data to, to increase your sample size and to come to a clear idea of what uh, a true answer to a clinical question is. Um, but they looked at randomized controlled trials uh, for several indications. So they looked at things like nausea and vomiting uh, associated with chemotherapy. Uh, they looked at appetite stimulation aids HIV. Because remember when you're uh, using THC that stimulates the appetite and so that can be useful for patients who are uh, malnourished or have wasting conditions. They don't really have that desire to eat, like if you had, you know, say, um, later complications of AIDS or if you were an uh, end-stage cancer patient, um, that can be useful to help stimulate that appetite. They also looked at it for chronic pain, spasticity due to multiple sclerosis, depression, anxiety, all these different conditions. They looked to see where medical marijuana was actually going to be uh, useful for. And so uh, they found most studies showed modest improvements, especially if they were being compared to placebo. Um, they found some uh, improvements there, but again, nothing was really a slam dunk. Like nothing came back and said, like, yeah, this is absolutely the gold standard therapy for uh, appetite stimulation in AIDS patients, right? It works, probably works okay, um, but maybe there's other options that are out there as well, right? And so what some of the recommendations were, and this came from an article in JAMA in, in 2015, so it's a journal of the American Medical Association, so it's a pretty, pretty well-respected uh, journal. Um, they basically came up with these recommendations, and I think these are pretty uh, safe to go with uh, currently. Um, but basically, medical marijuana candidate should be uh, or have a debilitating medical condition that we at least have some data from randomized controlled trials that would suggest marijuana has a positive effect. Uh, we would have failed other first and second line therapy first, right? This should not be the go-to drug for any of these conditions, but certainly they failed other therapies. Um, and then if they failed use of another FDA approved cannabinoid. So we'll talk about these when we get to the GI section, but we do have synthetic THC already available as FDA approved products. And so this is something like dronabinol, otherwise known as Marinol, that gets used for some cancer patients. Um, we'll talk about that in the GI section, but those also stimulate appetite. So maybe if they fail these, then you could uh, potentially consider marijuana. And then um, if they have no active substance abuse, psychotic disorder, or unstable mood or anxiety disorder. So if you have a stable, mentally uh, healthy patient, they might be uh, an okay candidate for this as well if they failed kind of other therapies already, right? So not everyone should go out and get this, um, but I'm sure there'll be some people who are a little bit more uh, liberal with their prescriptions than others. So just be, be aware of that. But this is what the current recommendations from kind of the, the medical consensus is. So, um, other things to consider uh, with looking at the pharmacokinetics, I didn't have a whole slide on this, but um, consider the pharmacokinetics uh, when looking at medical marijuana. So uh, if you were to inhale, uh, say you were to smoke the marijuana, how fast do you think the onset of, of action is? Pretty quick, right? You should have those effects because again, as we mentioned before, uh, as you inhale things, they go from the lungs to the heart, right to the brain, right? Versus something that was given, say, orally, how long do you think that would take? 45 minutes. Think 45 minutes? Else? Oh, that was a pretty quick answer. <laughs> what does anyone else think? <laughs> I've been to Colorado recently. And, um, it's funny, my brother, he, he lives in Seattle, and so he was just talking about the, um, just the, the, where all these places just have popped up, and there's like whole districts where it's just nothing but like marijuana shops, like, you know, as far as the eye can see. Um, but the big thing to worry about is with edibles. So edibles seem like a good, safe alternative to actually smoking some of this. Because again, as an asthmatic, I would not want to be smoking marijuana because you know I worry about exacerbating that you know chronic lung issues, especially with just that hot gas you're, you're inhaling. Um, not necessarily from the THC, it's just all the other crap you'd be, you'd be inhaling at that point. Um, but edibles have become a lot bigger business, especially in places where recreational use is more uh, is in place or places where medical use has been around for a long time. So edibles basically have the THC oil itself um, cooked into you know, cookies or um, uh, some drinks and, and brownies and all kinds of different things. Um, but the big problem is, is that people will underestimate the onset of action. And so what that means is, is that they will take a dose and they'll, they'll consume something and they'll wait 30 minutes, nothing happens. Wait 45 minutes, maybe nothing happens. They say, well, this obviously isn't working, I need to take more. 
So they end up taking more. Uh, and so then by the time they actually start to feel the first dose actually hit their system, which in some cases may take up to 90 minutes before it really starts to have their effect, they've already consumed two or three times the normal dose of what they should have taken. And so they get very, very um, intoxicated by using these. And so I've seen people consider it to be, uh, they, they call it being couch locked, where essentially like you just had so much TSC on board that you're just like on the couch, you're just you're not going anywhere for hours, right? <laughs> so. It's important to let your patient know that, hey, like just because uh, you don't feel anything within the first 45 minutes to an hour, don't take any additional doses. We'll give it at least 90 minutes uh, before you really start to say whether or not the, the dose is going to work for you, right? There's also other problems as well, especially where places where recreational use is going on to where the, um, how well regulated, like, you know, the, the recommended amount of marijuana or what they actually advertise as being in the product may be variable depending on which batch you get or which uh, manufacturer you go with. So that can be problematic as well to where you think you're getting one dose, but you're really not. You may be getting less or more. Um, so that can be problematic as well. So just be aware of that. Um, edibles, just be careful with them. Uh, if, if your patients are ever using them and just let them know that that takes longer to work than you would see with inhaling uh, some of the stuff, right? So any questions on medical marijuana? How does it work for glaucoma? So I, I don't know the mechanism specifically, but it's thought that through its interactions with the CB1 receptors that you would decrease intraocular pressure. So again, it's one of those things where it probably showed some moderate benefit, especially compared to placebo. So that's kind of where they're at with the evidence. What about like ALS and Parker Crohn's? I mean, there's a lot of strange... Right, and so some of them... Boost and yeah, a lot of it's appetite boosting. Energy. Yeah, so I don't know necessarily like the, the pain issues, um, you know, again, it's not going to work as well as something like an opioid, but, you know, it could be a useful adjuvant, could be something that they don't want to use opioids, they want to use something more natural, that could be an option for them. Um, so it just depends on, on, on the patient. But yeah, you mainly see it more for the appetite stimulation effects. I probably see more evidence for use for that than specifically just treating, you know, acute pain issues or anything like that. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned how damaging it could be to inhale it if you were uh, smoking it. And Clary talked earlier about inhaling anything but pure oxygen could potentially lead to emphysema. So I would assume that even through vaporization you wouldn't be completely safe from irritating the lungs. I think it's safer, um, especially if you are using something that is more purified. So if you're vaporizing just pure THC, you're probably a lot better off than actual plant product. Because again, there's a lot, I mean, you start to increase the number of compounds you're inhaling, you know, by 100,000 fold of all these different things you're inhaling. So at that point, you know, you worry about which ones are kind of procarcinogenic, which ones are, are safe for you to inhale, and it just gets, gets very dicey at that point. We just don't have enough information. Um, so yeah, you're probably right. There's probably some irritation going on. Um, the vaporization, I think, is, is you're still not inhaling the same temperature of gas as you would if you were to smoke it directly. Um, so it's probably safer, but again, nothing is going to be 100% safe, right? Even just breathing the air out by the, the highway is going to be dangerous for you long term, right? But even just by proxy with the temperature being like 360, 420 degrees Fahrenheit in the lungs, that would do damage? It, that, I mean, yeah, heat damage, absolutely. I mean, you see the same thing with smoking cigarettes. It's just that, that heat um, causing, you know, that dysplasia of the cells because they're responding to that. They're being injured. You know, that's where you can see a lot of um, cancerous changes happen to the, even in, without the effects of the other stuff you're inhaling, the tar and all, and all of that. Yep. Absolutely. Anything else? Okay, so again, this will probably get more information as we get it out there and more people are using it more consistently, but um, it's definitely an interesting change to see how it will affect our practice going forward. Um, but anyway, so conclusion, uh, pain management, it's pretty complex uh, as we've seen, um, and treatment really should be individualized to your specific patient. So again, not one thing is going to, not one strategy is going to fit every single patient you deal with. Um, but educate them well, um, look at your guide, um, or help them to guide selection, titration, conversion uh, of different dosage forms, um, and then make sure you're assessing for effectiveness um, as you go forward. So using your pain scales appropriately, make sure you know what their baseline is, how they've changed, setting those goals with them to where, you know, some patients may never get down to, uh, to a one, um, but maybe going from an eight to a six is going to be great for them, right? So come up with those goals uh, in conjunction with your patients, um, and then you can help them manage the side effects as well. So any questions on that section? Okay. So we talk a little bit, of, oh yes. I don't know, actually. I've not looked into the law that um, directly. I'm not sure if um, any of the mid-level pr uh, providers will be able to do that. It'd be interesting to see, though. Yeah. It's still Schedule One. Federally, yeah. So federally, marijuana is still considered a Schedule One. So at any point, the government can come in and say, "Nope, taking all your marijuana away." Um, but they've just chosen not to, right? Um, which is probably a good thing 
in the long run, especially with like jailing people for marijuana offenses and, and things like that. So uh, it's probably a societal plus. Uh, it may be controversial. I don't know. I should not record. Cut that out of the recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so um, yeah, so so moving on, we'll talk about venous thromboembolism. That is a another very potentially serious consequence of orthopedic surgery, as we'll see. Um, we've talked about a lot of uh, the medications we're already going to use for this previously, so we'll just kind of, if you need to review those slides, please go back because, again, that will be testable material, so just be aware of that. Um, but we know VTE is going to be a potentially fatal disorder. Um, the big patients who are at risk for this uh, we know are, are hospitalized patients, especially those that are not very mobile and getting up and walking around, um, especially after major surgery, so those orthopedic patients, uh, especially the lower extremities, um, and then anyone in those hypercoagulable states, right? So if they're on oral contraceptives or if they have any kind of factor um, mutation that allows them to be hypercoagulable, they're all at risk. And so uh, mainly going to be manifesting either as that DVT, I'm sure you guys know how to diagnose and what those look like, uh, and then also pulmonary embolism, which, you know, can be catastrophic, could lead to just, you know, sudden death. Uh, I don't know where if it's uh, significant enough. So um, risk factors, we mentioned, um, you know, some medications can help to, to increase this. Certain um, disease states can increase your risk for VTE. Um, but mainly the big thing is, is just uh, venous stasis is going to be a big problem. So obesity, uh, paralysis, immobility. Um, this is why it's so important that you worry about um, uh, VTE prophylaxis, especially in like, say, uh, critical care patients who were laid up in bed for, you know, weeks to months on end, right? You worry about VTE prophylaxis for them because um, now all of a sudden they're having a new um, new issue that's popping up and you, you can't don't know if it's due to a DVT or due to something else, um, just part of their, their normal disease process. Um, what are some ways, uh, some non-pharmacologic ways we can deal with preventing um, venous thromboembolism? STD. Yeah, SEDs are probably the biggest one. Obviously, getting them up and moving them around would be most beneficial, right? Um, but if they cannot do that, then an SED. So what is an SED? Sequential compression device. Yeah, sequential compression device. So again, you put it on their lower uh, extremities and basically kind of provides you know, squeezing uh, of uh, the limbs at various points uh, on a consistent manner to help kind of uh, improve that venous flow a little bit. So that's probably the, the best way to do it uh, from a non-pharmacologic standpoint uh, other than just mobility. Um, but we'll see in a lot of cases either um, patients may not be able to, to receive that, especially if they've had surgery on those sites, uh, or there may be some other reasons why they might not be able to. And that's where our pharmacologic prophylaxis will come into play. So um, again, we know how thrombuses are going to form, you know, especially if there is a site of injury, you have this platelets start to aggregate, um, and then you end up having uh, the clotting cascade being kicked off. I won't go into any more detail on this than we need to since we've covered this previously. Um, but basically, the big thing here we worry about is these fibrin clots forming, and then if they end up breaking off and going up into the pulmonary system, that's where we can run into some big problems. So the anticoagulants, we already talked about those. I will quiz you guys on them right now as I ask random questions, and hopefully you remember everything from Farm 1, right? Absolutely. It will be testable, though, so look that stuff up. So um, looking at prevention, we mentioned uh, looking at sequ uh, sequential compression devices are going to be good for this. Um, so for patients who are at higher risk for thrombosis, so say they're post-op surgery, uh, they just had a knee replaced or they just had a hip replaced, um, what can we do to prevent clots in them? And so one of the main ways we're going to use this is with our, uh, our heparins. So pr uh, traditionally, we would end up using things like unfractionated heparin, um, sub-Q, and you would actually end up giving that three times a day. Um, do you guys remember how you monitor for the anticoagulant effects of unfractionated heparin? It's like You're not technically wrong. For unfractionated, it's just PTT. Yeah, for unfractionated heparin, traditionally use APTT um, to monitor for those effects. And why do we use APTT versus, say, anti-factor 10? What does heparin work? What kind of factors is it working against? So primarily it's working, because remember how heparin works. It works by increasing the effects of antithrombin 3. And so primarily the two big coagulation factors you see it working against is 2 and 10, right? So because it has effects on 2, you can measure your APTT to see what the, the actual anticoagulant effects are, are on the patient. Um, normally for prophylaxis, you don't need to monitor for this, which is nice. So you can just give them kind of a standard dose, usually it's like 5,000 units, sub-Q, three times a day. And for the most part, they're good to go. Right, you don't necessarily need to worry about looking at their APTT unless you're doing actual therapeutic treatment uh, for an actual clot that's already been uh, diagnosed. Um, the other big one that we're going to use is going to be anoxaparin. Um, this one can be either given uh, at fixed doses either once daily or twice daily. And so this one, um, how would you measure the anticoag anticoagulant effects of this drug? 
Or is that it? Anti-factor 10. Anti-factor 10A, yeah, so absolutely. So this is measuring the, the activity of uh, anoxaparin against factor 10, right? Because remember, it's a shorter molecule. It's a low molecular weight heparin, which means it's not able to effectively uh, work against factor 2, but factor 10 is okay to, to work against, right? So uh, anoxaparin is good for that. Um, rarely will we use anti-factor 10A levels to monitor this for prophylaxis purposes, sometimes in very obese patients um, who you're not sure they're getting enough drug, or sometimes in our uh, pediatric patients we'll do anti-10A levels for them to make sure that they're achieving the right level uh, for prophylaxis. And, and so you'll end up seeing that where you'll have uh, prophylaxis levels and then treatment levels. And so obviously for treatment of an active clot, you want to have a higher uh, amount of anticoagulant activity. You're going to be using a larger dose, and that way you get a higher anti-10A level in order to deal with that clot, right? So the idea is by giving the anticoagulants, you prevent the clot from getting any worse and allow your body to naturally clear that away by using things like um, you know, doing... Um, uh, clearing away that fibrin, uh, fibrinolysis, right? So we want to do that naturally. If it's a shorter molecule, why is the half-life longer on the anoxaparin? So um, it could have just been engineered that way, so that way it, um, you know, it's manufactured to stick around for longer, perhaps. You know, the liver is not really able to, to bind to it as easily. Um, to smaller, it's harder to get a hold of. Potentially, yeah, so I'm not sure uh, specifically why that is, but you know, with the larger molecule, perhaps it's just easier for the deliver to kind of start chewing that up and to where it, putting it into less effective molecules, right? Um, so that's probably one of the main ways that, that that's happening. Yep. But anyway, noxaparin is nice because it lasts longer. So for a lot of patients, you can get away with once daily dosing. So just one subcutaneous shot versus having to give them two or three. Uh, I've seen in some other cases. Um, and then fondaparinux is another option as well. What factors does this one work against? This one is 10 only, right? Because this is an even shorter molecule. This one is only going to work against factor 10. So again, you can monitor anti-factor 10A levels for this one as well. Um, sometimes this is good for patients who have a history of HIT. You guys remember what HIT is? Yeah, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, right? That's an immune reaction where you don't want to give them anoxaparin or heparin again because you can induce this thrombocytopenia and kind of this all-over uh, disseminated clotting event. Um, but uh, fondaparinux is, is, does not cross-react with that. So in, so in a lot of cases, you can use this as an alternative. So those are the most common ones. I probably see anoxaparin being used most frequently, unless there's some reason they could not receive that, then in which heparin would be used instead. Um, but again, for patient satisfaction purposes, anoxaparin is going to be a better option because it's only uh, usually one time a day for prophylaxis purposes, right? This is only for prophylaxis we're talking about at this point. Okay. Um, and so normally for post-operative uh, management for these patients, because we know they're in a hypercoagulable state, they just had their hip replaced or their knee replaced, um, they usually are going to require uh, 10 to 14 days of therapy in order to keep them anticoagulated to prevent, because again, you're putting foreign material into the body that's going to be more pro-coagulant um, your body can, can potentially react with. So by anticoagulating them, lets the body kind of get used to it and then you don't have to worry about that any longer. Of course, early ambulation is going to be preferred. Getting them up, walking them around helps to decrease a lot of venous stasis and decrease their risk pretty significantly from, from that standpoint. Okay. So um, as far as treatment goes, uh, essentially I put these tables up here, and this is really just to give you an idea of when you use the different drugs. Um, but essentially, uh, if you're looking at your patient, you can kind of start up here at the top of the page. So you can see, okay, let's say we have an objectively confirmed VTE. How would you... How'd you Confirm a VTE. All right, so you can do you can do Doppler. Other ways. D-dimer, right? So you guys know how to diagnose that. Once you find one, though, um, then you want to see whether or not anticoagulation can be used. So again, if you have a reason that you cannot anticoagulate those patients, so say for instance they're at risk for bleeding, um, they have a history of say hemorrhagic stroke that you don't want to uh, worry about, um, how could you prevent clots or prevent a PE from occurring? IVC, right? So this is when you can put that vena cava filter, right? So basically preventing the clots from ever getting back to the lungs. Okay, so that's one way you can do that. So for some patients, that might be their only option. Otherwise, um, you look and determine if they have a PE. Once you've made that decision, then you have to decide um, what type of uh, therapy you want to use. For patients who are having kind of massive uh, PE or if they're developing shock, that's when you need to consider things like thrombolytic therapy. Do you guys remember any uh, drugs you can use for thrombolysis? Alteplase or TPA. Uh, as a drug you can use for that. So that, again, we'll go in directly and, and convert that tissue plasminogen activator, um, activate uh, plasmin, and start to, to lyse that clot, right? So that's our clot buster. Um, so that's a, a good one. You could also use something like tenecteplase. Uh, Retoplase might be another one, but usually alteplase is the big one you see being used there. So that would be good for if you had a patient who was in shock due to a PE, you could lyse that clot right there, right? 
Most patients do not, um, unfortunately, do not get to that point. They don't necessarily need to worry about that so much. Um, but if it was just going to be, uh, you know, extensive proximal DVT, this is when you can consider anticoagulation. The drugs are going to be the same here. You either use a continuous infusion, unfractionated heparin, right? So that would be your just regular plain heparin being given by continuous infusion. Usually you get your APTT to something like one and a half, two times the normal level. Uh, or you could use your low molecular weight heparin. So noxaparin is kind of your go-to there. And then you get your doses higher. Usually you're gonna give this one now twice a day, right? For prophylaxis, you can get away with just once daily dosing, but with treatment, twice daily is gonna be the way to go with that one, okay? And then after that point, you wanna consider more long-term uh, anticoagulation. So that's when you can start to think about things like warfarin, right? We know that um, warfarin itself takes some time to work because that's deplete liver uh, clotting factors. Um, other things like rivaroxaban could be potentially used, dabigatran. Um, again, go review those drugs and make sure you know how they work, what their side effects are, all those kind of things. Um, <clears throat> And then um, if they have the, the clot, they, you've anticoagulated them, you've treated them, and now switched them over to uh, oral therapy with either warfarin or, or something like rivaroxaban, um, usually they end up being on therapy for about three months or so. Uh, at that point, then you have to kind of consider, okay, are they, you know, have they gotten rid of those risk factors? Are, are those reversible risk factors they had before gone? If so, then you don't necessarily need any longer therapy. Uh, but if they do have kind of ongoing uh, concerns, then you would want to keep uh, some of those drugs on board. Switch right? them over to warfarin. The goal is to, um, when you have the initial diagnosis and you need to uh, therapeutically treat them, start with those heparins, uh, and then you switch them over to oral therapy, right? But again, you have to do that bridge therapy where you continue the anoxaparin or the heparin. Um, you start up the warfarin, because warfarin's effects are not gonna be immediate, uh, and then eventually once that warfarin gets to INR, right, because that's your monitoring parameter for that, once that gets up to, you know, say, um, you know, between two and three, um, then you go ahead and you can stop the heparin all the while you're monitoring for bleeding and, and all that good stuff. Okay. So any questions on that? The, the anticoagulants that are given for um, the patients on, with AFib, are they also effective? Pretty much, yeah. I don't. Um, most of them got a lot of their uh, indications for prevention of stroke and AFib because that was kind of the more big ticket item probably, or the more, more common thing that people would need to be treated for. Um, but yeah, I imagine they would have very similar effects. Yep. And keep in mind, a lot of those other ones are going to work a little bit faster than warfarin does because mm -hmm. some of them are either direct 10, uh, direct, uh, or factor 10 inhibitors, some of them are going to be uh, thrombin inhibitors. Um, so based on that, you don't have to worry about depleting liver clotting factors, so they end up having a shorter bridge time. When would they take out the IVC filter? That is a very good question that I have no idea about. <laughs> I, um, I mainly worked in the ICU where I saw them getting placed and then they went off to wherever happy land they went to. <laughs> I never saw them again. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Using um, catheter guided uh, TPA administration is kind of a really neat way to use that drug because instead of giving it systemically and getting the drug everywhere where it could potentially cause bleeding, if you can administer it in a very targeted manner, um, you can get away with a lot less drug and working only specifically in the area you want it to. So we have a lot of our like interventional radiologists. Um, we have over at Nemours like that's his, his bread and butter to do those kind of catheter guided um, TPA administrations. Very cool. All right, so any other questions on that? All right, so that's going to be it for orthopedics. I have a little bit of time left. So I'm going to start up in some of the uh, behavioral section.